Welcome to the 10th in our series of Urban Transport Next Conversations with a live online audience on the topics that will help to determine the future of urban transport. Whether you are spending your lunchtime with us listening live or listening back to the podcast later or watching the playback on YouTube, thanks for joining us. I'm Claire Linton, Policy and Research Advisor at the Urban Transport Group, the organisation that's hosting these events. For those of you that don't know us, we bring together the public sector transport authorities for the largest urban areas, Transport for London, Transport for Greater Manchester, Transport for West Midlands and all the other major metro areas, serving over 20 million people. As well as being a body that thinks ahead about what next for urban transport, our members can implement that thinking on the ground and can learn collectively from these kind of events. I'm really pleased that we've got so many people signed up to take part in this event. Wales pushing ahead with ambitious transport policies that recognise the scale of the climate crisis, including cancellation of the M4 relief road, a road building freeze and plans for a groundbreaking metro system. So today we have an interview with Lee Waters, Deputy Minister for Climate Change in the Welsh Government. Before being elected in May 2016, Lee was Director of Wales's leading independent think tank, the Institute for Welsh Affairs. He previously ran the sustainable transport charity, Sus Trans Cymru, where he led the campaign for the Active Travel Act. And Lee will be in conversation with Jonathan Bray, Director of the Urban Transport Group, a position he has held since 2008. He's also visiting senior fellow at LSE Cities. Jonathan's career has been about developing progressive policies on transport and advocating effectively for them. You can also be part of this conversation in three ways. Firstly, by putting your questions, keep them short and sharp, via the Zoom questions box, and you can also vote for your favourite questions there too. We'll be picking these up in the final section of the conversation. You can also post in the comments channel on Zoom and join in via Twitter using the hashtag UTGnext. So I'll hand over to Jonathan. Thanks, Claire. And uh, thanks, Lee. Um, some exciting things happening in Wales. I'm really looking forward to having this hour to explore them with you and with our audience. Um, I want to split the uh, conversation into three parts. The story so far in Wales on transport, the, the new path for Wales, the transport strategy, and then what the future holds. And then we can open it up to the audience. But first, let's find out a bit more about you, Lee. Tell us a bit about your background, where you're from, and how did your interest in sustainable transport start? Mm, okay, well, hello, and nice to see you again, Jonathan. Um, I've uh, done a number of things, really. So I'm from uh, southwest Wales, from the, the Ammon Valley, uh, sort of between Swansea and Carmarthen. Uh, and I went into journalism. Uh, I was a, a BBC report producer and a chief political correspondent for ITV Wales and did that for about six years. And that was fine. Enjoyed, you know, getting drunk on expenses and having free haircuts. That was fun. Um, but I increasingly felt there was no purpose to it, really. And I became a school governor in parallel. And as a, as a volunteer, I was able to change things. And in my day job, even though my mother liked seeing me on the telly, I wasn't changing anything. And, you know, as soon as I'd done something, it was literally gone into the ether, nothing to show for it. So I wanted to do something meaningful. Um, and a job came up with Sustrans in Wales. Didn't know much about Sustrans. Didn't know a great deal about sustainable transport agenda. Didn't own a bike, had two cars. Um, but I had, you know, a firm set of instincts. And I can remember reading a report that Lynn Sloman and Ian Taylor had done for Sustrans as part of my research process for the job. And I just thought, you know, there are, there are pennies dropping all over the place here. And this isn't just about uh, cycling, because, you know, who cares about cycling, frankly? It's a means to an end. This is about a worldview. This is about a better society, a more civilised way to live, uh, a, a more friendly neighbourhoods, more local shops. Those, those are things that moved me. Uh, and so I went for the job and I was amazed to get it. Uh, and that's how I got into sustainable transport, really. And, you know, as they say, there's no zealot like a convert. Uh, you know, very much warmed to the theme and, and, and thoroughly enjoyed the challenge of trying to change minds and change thinking. Uh, and I did that for six years uh, and enjoyed it and grew the organisation and all the rest of it, but then wanted to do something else and then I joined a small um, think tank, uh, which was essentially a failing small business, so that was a real challenge, and then decided, well, I can either keep writing reports saying how crap things are, or I can roll my sleeves up and try and get involved. 
and you know Welsh politics is still we're only twenty years into devolution. Our Senate, our Parliament is uh, still small. My first job out of university was working for the politician who created uh, the Assembly, like Ron Davis. Um, so I was politically interested, but not active. Um, but wanted both to give something back to the area I came from, but also to try and make a difference on the Welsh national stage to try and create a better society rather than just complaining about it. And how does it feel being on the inside compared to being on the outside? Bloody exhausting is how it feels, if I'm honest. Um, but it's fascinating. You know, it is very interesting because I've because I've you know I viewed the ring from different seats in the auditorium. Really, it was a, as a as a as a, uh, a political uh, you know, speechwriter, as a uh, as a journalist, as a campaigner on a delivery organisation, uh, as a policy uh, wonk, if you like, as a backbench member of the parliament, and now as a minister. And there are you know it's fascinating. Just comparing those different points of view and, and understanding how to make the system move. Um, and I remember Bevan uh, had this wonderful line about the coat tails of power disappearing around the corner. He said when he was a, a miner in the, in the mines of Tredegar, uh, he wanted to change things and was told, oh, you know, there's no good changing things. All the powers in the union, you need to join the union. So he joins the union and so was told, oh, you know, the power was here, but now it's with the Urban District Council. So he joined the Urban District Council and sure enough was again told that the power was there, but he had moved to Parliament. So he became a member of parliament and was told the power was in the cabinet and he got to the cabinet and was told the power was in the prime minister and he described the what he, the way he summed it was the coat tails of power disappearing around the corner every time he got close uh, and i you know I, I i really like that analogy because you know the power is the power is diffuse isn't it it's you know it's it isn't just sitting in one place you know robert caro has done these brilliant books on lyndon johnson and lyndon johnson's great gift was creating power out of nothing taking a uh, an inconsequential role to begin with and infusing it with power and a determination to make things move and you know his whole career is a fascinating story of that and i think in the same way you know all our different roles are different because each of us is able to make change happen in different ways uh, and each is valid and necessary um but but having followed those coattails of power constantly you know I, i'm now privileged to have the chance to be the transport minister in Wales to try and move it from that point of view but clearly I don't hold all the levers it's still a diffuse game of trying to spot the contours yeah it's a great phrase that isn't it and there's something around the soft power element of some of these roles which you can yep. see a lot in the mayors even the London mayor's powers are not quite what they might appear but if you fill that part if you play that part then it becomes the part doesn't it so um yeah it's uh, it's interesting um but let's look at um, what has been achieved um, and uh, what's been done so far uh, uh, in Wales. So uh, starting off with that to travel, mm -hmm. um, because you fought long and hard to secure the world's first active travel act and to, to raise levels of walking and, uh, and cycling when you were outside of government. How successful do you think that uh, legislation has been in practice and, and more widely on active travel now you're in government which are the policies that you're pursuing uh you're most excited about do you think is going to be most effective in getting people who who don't currently use bikes onto bikes well again just to say you know i don't fetishize bikes for the sake of bikes okay i'm not a cyclist i'm not uh, somebody who does it for fun for me it is a means to an end it is a it is a, it is a mode of transport with significant modal shift potential uh, and it has multiple positive benefits for society if done right you know the research is quite clear you are more likely to speak to your neighbor if you walk and cycle rather than drive you are more likely to spend money in a local shop than if you walk and drive uh you know, there's an impact on air quality on uh, uh, uh on road safety and casualties uh, on congestion and obviously overall on emissions and i you know the the Having just come back from COP, you know, I, I, I do think the science around climate change is really quite terrifying. Transport accounts for 17% of those emissions. Transport's been given a free ride for too long in, in playing its part in bringing those emissions down. And that's got to change. And I think cycling has a 
has a part to play for those journeys, particularly those, those half of all journeys under five miles. Uh, it won't apply to everyone. It won't apply to every journey, but it can apply to quite a lot of them. And we don't have to look very far from this country to find societies where it is normal. And you know, back to your point earlier, when I when I joined Sustrans, um, I I got this, I got a fold up bike with a job, uh, and uh, I was very eccentric on my fold up bike driving around Cardiff in two thousand and seven. Hardly anybody was cycling. Eccentric people were cycling. And now, if you stand on any major path in Cardiff at uh, commuter times, it's normal. Certainly pre-pandemic, it was normal. You know, it was everywhere. In Llanachie, where I live and represent, it's where Cardiff was in 2007. It's still an eccentric thing to do. It's, it's a leisure thing to do. It's not an everyday thing to do. So, you know, change, you know, takes a long time and then comes quick. Uh, and But it's possible. And we can see throughout the country where, where that well, that is uh, is working. Now, the purpose behind the Active Travel Act was to try and use the plumbing of government, the machinery, to, to look at it as a structural and a strategic problem. Uh, and, and that's what I did. Is, and, you know, Sustrans, I was, a, I was a curious beast in Sustrans when I was there because I'd come from a political point of view and Sustrans was full of, uh, you know, either tree huggers or engineers who felt guilty for work they'd done in the past. Uh, and I was sort of slightly odd beast and and to be fair to them they let me have my head in pursuing the, the political track um but it was from an analysis of uh this is the starting point you know uh, the dft you know, pays for the maintenance of roads it does not pay for the maintenance of the national cycle network sustrans have to do that i can't be right so that was the germ the seed really and thinking it through and you know and over time and understanding more well why why is why are we not treating active travel as a, as a mode of transport uh, and why is it left to a charity to make it happen um and i thought well until we change the structure and the mindset we are not going to get this taken seriously as a modal shift um agenda now at the time the parliament in wales had some new powers and they were looking for ideas of laws to take through so i came up with this idea of an, of an active travel act and built a coalition and my first of insight was uh Nobody cares about cycling. 2%, 1% of journeys about cycling. If you make this about cycling, you're not going to get anywhere politically. You've got to make it about health. You've got to make it about climate change. You've got to look for the levers that people do resonate with. So I built a coalition of organisations like the British Heart Foundation and the BMA and Royal Mail and BT, who cared about different elements of it, but, but together could come to, come as one and use their, their brand and their reach to make this a mainstream agenda. So that's what we did, and we got we got it in mass party manifestos, and it was implemented. How's it going? Well, like the curate's egg, you know, it's good in parts, uh, but it was never going to be a flicking a switch. Um, so what what the Active Travel Act does literally is requires so it puts a statutory duty on local authorities or highway authorities, including the Welsh government, to uh, plan and develop a network of routes for active travel. So every three years they have to consult and develop then a map of a network. Uh, and then the funding is aligned to the delivery of that map. So what we've been doing over the last number of years is, is getting that, that sort of pipeline going. We've had two iterations now of a set of design standards that we're measuring it uh, against. Uh, and you know, we are, you know, it's only as good as its weakest part is the truth, like any net network. Uh, and we have some local authorities who have taken to it with enthusiasm. Cardiff, for example, have been doing great stuff, showing really bold political leadership, reallocating road space from cars to active travel, uh, putting a resource of their own in. And we, and I've, one of my early critical decisions, I think, was to say, we're not going to give everybody a little bit of everything. We're going to reward ambition and boldness. So if Cardiff have got ambition and want to do stuff, we will overfund Cardiff and then defend somebody else. And I think that's the right thing to do. And Cardiff are really developing momentum now. And hopefully that will show an example to others. But we are constrained by the capacity of local authorities, about the capability of transport departments, about the willingness to see this as a serious mode of transport about their ability to engage with communities, because at its heart, this is a behaviour change and a heart and mind operation. And that is hard and it takes time and there are pockets of resistance and there's ignorance and misunderstanding around it and all those things. So this is not going to be a quick job. This is a process over time. And I think, you know, 
We're definitely making progress. We're not going as fast as I want us to do. I find it very frustrating, um, but we're, we're far better off than we were 10 years ago. Five years ago, when I was elected, we were spending £5 million a year on active travel schemes. This year, we're spending £75 million. And we're going to keep that momentum going. And perhaps uh, linking that with the wider attitudes about what you do with highways, and the, there's always been a traditional kind of engineering led focus and uh, perhaps a lot of district engineers, they want to get that big road scheme in um, yep. before they retire. Um, but one of the things that perhaps sent the biggest indicator to um, the rest of the UK around the, the changes of direction in Wales was the, uh, despite the opposition of the UK government, was the cancellation of the M4 relief roads. Um, tell us a bit about the battle over that and the reasoning behind it and what's the next stages uh what's going to happen instead with that funding well it's been an on-off story the m4 because it was cancelled uh, i don't know seven eight years ago and then brought back onto the agenda and the heavy lobbying from business uh, and when i was elected it was a labor party manifesto commitment and our first minister at the time was very committed to it and the first things i did as a new backbencher was to wriggle and argue against it uh, and it's when we changed first minister to the current first minister mark drakeford uh, we saw the shift in decision making and it was a complicated and difficult set of processes because it was quasi judicial but ultimately the decision was made that the costs had gone to such a stage you know to 700 million to begin with it was nearing two billion by the time it reached decision point and also you know the world had moved on in terms of climate change and biodiversity and the inspector report did not pay much attention to that at all so those two things gave the first minister grounds to turn down the the orders and to to send the signal as you say uh, that we need a different the different approach, but just as crucially was what happened then next. So it was created the setting up under Lord uh, Terry Burns, former Permanent Secretary of the Treasury of the South East Wales Transport Commission, the Burns Commission. And that produced a, a, a report on looking at alternatives to tackling congestion without building a motorway. And that has just been endorsed last week uh, by Sir Peter Hendy and his Union Connectivity Review, a really significant intervention. I think one that hasn't been much commented on because we've heard politically the Prime Minister as recently as September saying that they were going to go over the heads of the of the Welsh Government, they were going to build the M4, take the foot off the dragon's throat and all this crap. Um, but, you know, but, but they'd set up this Union Connectivity Review and the pressure being on Peter Hendy to back the road and fair play to Peter Hendy, he did not. And explicitly said that the you know he's warmly endorsed the report of the Burns Commission. Now we've got to develop that, we've got to fund that, we've got to deliver that. And one of the difficulties we have is that rail infrastructure is not a devolved responsibility. So we have the, the Welsh rail franchise run by Transport for Wales that we run the services, but we don't control uh, the, the track apart from the Core Valleys line, which we've had devolved to build a metro. But rail investment is deeply, deeply unequal in this country. So on HS2, for example, uh, this is a £98 billion pound project. Uh, and normally, it, it, it's just in England. It literally does not have a mile of track in Wales. It's an England-only transport project. And normally, the way the funding mechanism in the UK works, forgive me for those of you who already know this, called the Barnett formula, if a £100 million is spent in England in a devolved area, we will get a Barnett share based on our population. So we get 5% of the population, we get 5% of the £100 million, which we can spend on what we like. That goes into our pot. We can spend it on health. We can do what we like with it. This project, £98 billion, is regarded as not a, an England-only project. It's regarded as a project for the benefit of the whole of the UK. Therefore, we get diddly squat from it. So, so there's a huge imbalance there. And the business case of HS2 shows a negative impact on the Welsh economy. So not only not getting a share of the spend, it's actually taking money out of our, our economy. And it points to a broader problem of imbalance around rail spend. And we've seen this in the Northeast uh, recently. You know, if we had, we've got something like 12% of the, uh, uh, of the track in the UK and Wales, we've got 5% of the population and we get 2% of the rail spend. Uh, so we're underfunded for about £5 billion pounds worth. And that makes it very difficult then to implement a modal shift agenda when that, when that investment just is not there for us. So there's some serious bits of the Burns recommendation around the South Wales main line that needs to be funded by the UK government. And they've been very slow to react, but but the Burns, the uh, 
Hindi report recommended that be supported. They've released some money for studies, and hopefully we'll see them follow through now to create a modern public transport system for the Newport area, which we hope and studies suggest, uh, you know, will will achieve the same Im impact as the M4, but for half the price. And sticking with rail, I think another big indicator and a step change in ambitions around Wales has been the transformation of the rail network in South Wales, which um, is now underway. You know, what do you think the significance of this project will be to communities in, in the valleys? And, and also, is that full benefit going to be realised? Because I think sometimes with the rail there's a tendency to see these as an engineering project, to build them uh, and then walk away. Um, but uh, it always seemed to me in the valleys that it's probably got the best case anywhere for fully integrating bus and rail with the rail providing that linear route um, down to the to Cardiff um, and uh, bus services fanning out from there. So give us a flavour of what your ambitions are for what these rail transformation can achieve for the valleys. Well, I think you're right to qualify the claims. You know, in the old Mario Cuomo, the governor of New York's court, you know, we, we campaign in poetry, we govern in prose. Uh, and the campaign for the Metro is, is one you can wax lyrical about. But to make it happen, you've got to get the prose right. Uh, and that's a lot of detail and granularity and a lot of uh, bringing lots of different complex structures and systems together. So the bus system, for example, you know, to, to get truly joined up integrated transport, you know, we need franchising. We don't yet uh, have that. We are, will be introducing a white paper next year and a bill to pass Welsh legislation to create a franchising system in Wales so we can move towards one timetable, one ticket, one fare. That's, you know, that is a crucial part of making sure that the Metro will deliver its potential. Uh, the rail bit, you know, what's I think what's really innovative for us anyway about the, the Metro system is, is, the, is, the, is the rail, the tram, the tram rail a combination. It's going to be light rail. It's going to be on road in in bits of Cardiff, and I think this will start to really shift perceptions of what public transport is, what it looks like, how it works, how attractive it is. Um, so that I think you know we are we are well underway in the planning. Of that it's a massive, complex infrastructure project. We're spending around a, a share of a billion pounds uh, on it, but we've got to get those. Like I was saying earlier, you know, networks only as strong as its weakest part. We've got to get those crucial bits of interfaces right and crucially also we can't just treat it as an infrastructure project we have to have a behavior change element to it as well because simply building the infrastructure will not bring the full potential of modal shift just to explore what you're saying about bus franchising as as well because obviously we've seen uh, that moving forward uh, uh, as fast as it can do in places like greater manchester under the uh, Westminster legislation. Are, are there lessons that you think can be learned from both the uh, difficulties in using the legislation that Wales currently has, but also uh, the remaining challenges around the legislation uh, that currently applies from Westminster? Yes, and I think you know this goes to a broader point about uh, the Urban Transport Group, really, really, uh, Jonathan. Is is we need to use it to learn from each other far more, I think, you know, because through your membership and associated membership, we're covering about half the population of the country and we don't need to follow the Westminster mode the whole time. We can develop our own ways of doing things. And we, we, we've been watching and, and I think trying to learn from the Manchester experience because we were following a similar path of these partnership models. And I do think the commercial bus industry has been very effective at kicking sand in our eyes really about developing these various different partnership models which essentially is designed to uh, to buy time and to keep the status quo and the status quo is broken uh, and so having seen what Manchester how, you know how difficulty Manchester are having in implementing this and how long they've taken and how, and how much more resource they have than most of our authorities I think it's it's made us realize we need to take a different path so we were before the election, going down the path of the partnership model, we are changing direction and we are not going to go down that model. And we are now trying to co-produce with Welsh local authorities a different model where we use Transport for Wales as a strategic centre of expertise, uh, as, a, as, a, as a delivery arm, but we, we, we co-produce genuinely with local authorities how that works in practice. So which bits do the local authorities best 
be fully in charge of, which bits do we collaborate regionally within Wales on, and which bits are done by a guiding mind in the centre in the form of TFW and the Welsh Government. And, and through that different different approach, hopefully we can, we can get action faster than some others have been able to do through the current legislation. So um, we've explored some of the uh, issues around some of the modes and the story so far. I'd just like to move on to the new Welsh transport strategy, the the new path for Wales. And it'd be good to understand what you think is, is different about this transport strategy from the kind of typical uh, national and regional transport strategies we see. I mean, clearly one of the things that uh, stands out there and there's also been taken forward in the wider net zero plan for Wales is the targets for increasing modal share of public transport and active travel which uh, I think from 32% to 45% by 2040 and for a 10% reduction in per capita car use below 2019 levels by 2030. So could you say a bit about how that's going to drive that transport strategy and, and what kind of mechanisms do you think are going to be most effective to achieve that? Well, first of all, I know I've been around the block before on a, on a, on a transport strategy and my experience from the last one was, uh, you know, if you're an alien coming from Mars and you read the transport strategy, you'd think, wow, what a progressive place Wales is with this multimodal transport system with all the mention of sustainable transport. But of course, in practice, it was nothing like that. Uh, and I think the trick had been played many a time where it said all the wonderful things that you'd expect it to say. And then in the, the schemes to be delivered, it was all the usual schemes. So I was quite determined this time we weren't going to go through that again. And this one, you know, this one needs to be a disruptive document. Uh, so I think there's a couple of things which I think were significant. One is to say we, when you're explicitly going to try and reduce demand for transport, it's not something we'd said before in a, in a transport strategy. And then secondly, explicitly, we have modal shift as a, as a central aim of the transport strategy and the government's policy, which again had, had, had not been done uh, as a sort of a central organising principle. Uh, now, again, easier to say than it is to do. So because you know we are working within a system where orthodox thinking and practice prevails and many of the structures, thinking of the appraisal methodology as, as a perfect example, mitigate towards business as usual. So it's, you know, saying what you're going to do and in policy terms is relatively easy. Changing the way the system works in practice to, to, to get to different outcomes is devilishly difficult. And that's the process we're going through now because there are all sorts of, of choke points built in to try and stop change and to try and push back to what we've always done. Uh, and, and that's the process, you know, so the, the strategy says the right things, what are we going to do about it? And that's why I'm sure you want to come on to it. That's why we instituted the, the roads review of freezing all road building programmes. Because unless the handbrake was applied, the system would just kept on doing what the system did. And one of the, come back to the roads review in, in a second, and I see this is already popping up in the uh, questions in the chat. But the, the other thing that really stands out from the transport uh, strategy is uh, the uh, commitment to establishing a framework for equitable road user charging. Because it, it just seemed to me that if we're really serious about modal shift, then we are going to need that fundamental rebalancing of the cost of public and private transport. And um, it's exciting and intriguing to see those words. Yep. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what those words might translate to into in terms of, of next steps. And also, um, I guess the other side of the coin is the, is the cost of public transport. Yeah. And um, as you're probably aware, around the world, people now are moving, or many countries and individual cities are moving to either free fares or free fares for uh, low-income households, in that Los Angeles and Leipzig, or flat and cheap, like... Uh, the climate ticket in Aus Austria, which also builds on the Vienna one euro a day system. So sorry, that's a very long uh, statement slash question, but it comes down to the road user charging and fares. Yeah. So on road user charging, I would say I'm bold, I'm not stupid. Uh, so what I'm not going to do is to is to do something which is counterproductive. So I think it's all about the timing. Uh, now, I think it is really important that if you are going to 
take something from someone or be perceived to take something from them, you have to give them something else, preferably something better. Uh, so my feeling is we need to put in place first some of the changes which show that there is a practical alternative to the car. You have to incentivize before you start to disincentivize. And I think the timing and the sequencing of that is, is crucial. Because um, this is, you know, this is as well as a operational and practical matter. This is also about culture change. And it's about culture wars, frankly. You know, we know and we're seeing it through the anti-vax uh, movement, you know, there are going to be at least 20% of people who are just going to be obdurately opposed to this. As there always is. You know, I was I was struck by some clip I saw on YouTube the other day of Vox Pops taken when seat belts were introduced in America. And the, the stuff that people were coming up with were exactly the things people are saying about vaccinations today. Uh, and there is, you know, and, and I'm and we're getting it at the moment around 20 mile an hour speed limits as well. You know, this feeling of authority taking away their liberty and freedoms and telling them what to do. And that is a that is that cannot be dismissed or minimized as a political force i think it's not something ultimately we should uh capitulate to but it, but we have we can't ignore it so i'm uh, very attracted to the idea of a you know a, a, a benefits uh, and charge policy so you know you do uh, you do build in charging uh, but you but you put the benefits in advance of that and then you signpost you're going to do it uh, so that's something we're we're looking at but you know we need to get that right so i'm not going to rush it um forgive me i've lost my train of thought what was uh, the, the other a long question. It was a very long question. Um, I, I was also talking about fares. Yeah. Um, but perhaps just to explore the the road user charging point uh, a bit more first, because it is quite a challenge, isn't it? Because if you look at London accepted, uh, well, because partly because Ken Livingston originally had a, a very strong mandate, basically a two term mandate. Uh, but public transport was already pretty good. Yeah, well, it wasn't privatized, uh, and it wasn't privatized. And Manchester, for example. Uh, public transport, arguably better than um, in uh, parts of Wales, yep. but still not good enough to persuade the voters who voted it down yep. four to one. And also the, the councillor who uh, promoted it uh, lost his seat. So in terms of building up those benefits in Wales, that would take quite a while, wouldn't it? Um, uh, before you could introduce road user charging. And so there's quite a lot of preparatory work is there not that would need to be done on, on road user journey? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot going on in parallel here, isn't there? And crucially, the, dif you know, the difference now and the Manchester situation was, is that, you know, is that road tax is falling away. You know, you cannot charge a petrol tax if cars don't run on petrol. Uh, so the Treasury are already looking at forms of user charging themselves. And I think that completely changes the context of the of the debate as it, as it ought to. So there is a debate to be had about how we uh, tax uh, people uh, and how we try and build in some behavior changing nudges in the way that we design that. Um, as I say, I'm, I am, you know, we're doing some quite bold stuff in Wales. Um, but I'm not going to push my luck because I, because I think it's, as I say, I think it's counterproductive. Um, there are schemes, you asked on fares, there are schemes, we've had some experiments in Welsh councils in Swansea from free bus fares on weekends. Mm -hmm. So this is beginning to emerge, I think. I think fares is a really important part of making uh, buses in particular more attractive. And we are looking at the moment of what we can do around fares. It's complicated and it's expensive. One of the structural challenges we have is the capital revenue split. And this is not something much commented upon. It's a fairly nerdy point. It'll be very familiar to everybody on this call, I'm sure. But it, it is a real barrier to achieving behavior change and to achieving modal shift. And it's one of the reasons why road building, in a sense, is an easier go-to because of the Treasury rules make it so. And these aren't, you know, these aren't handed down on tablets of stone. These are political rules. They can be changed, but they need to be changed at the Treasury level. Uh, and I think that is something that I'm bumping up against at the moment is how to work within that system to achieve the sort of mode shift that we want to we want to see. But we do have to confront the issue of disincentives, but I think we have to do it in a considered way. So, so moving on to the um, road building moratorium again um something that's getting a lot of attention and rightly so um how is that process uh, going to be carried out and what about the challenges where you've got 
uh, communities with in, in, in rural areas who've been wanting a bypass for a long time? What kind of alternatives can be offered to those communities in, in mitigation for the loss of the, the benefits that they perceived would come from a bypass? So lots of elements to that. So first of all, I think sending, as I touched on earlier, sending a signal to the system that we can't just keep on doing what we've always done is really important. And as you well know, you know, if you're a, an incoming transport minister, you are faced with a scheme that's been in development for six, seven years. There's already been a lot of money spent on it. There's already local expectation of it. So it is very difficult then for an incoming minister to say, I'm going to stop that road scheme. It's almost impossible and it never happens. Um, so w- what I'm determined to do is to give my successors greater flexibility to st- to 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 choke off that pipeline and i think you know i'm not saying we're never going to build roads in wheels again of course we are but it shouldn't be the default easy go-to option that it often is and as you very well know the way that web tag well tag stag whatever different versions of it are called in practice the local authorities who are sitting down going through that process have already made their mind up what they want to happen. They want a road to happen nine times out of 10, and they're very easily able to game that system to produce a road outcome. And then, so it goes through the system. So that needs to be disrupted. And that's the purpose of the roads review is to, is to freeze all schemes, not currently uh, where contracts are let or diggers in the ground. Um, so that's proven difficult and controversial and uh, you know politically complex. Uh, it's then to say the existing roads are frozen and no more development happens on them. And then the crucial part is to say, right, in future, what toolkit are we going to come up with, which says it's in these circumstances, roads are the right answer, despite, you know, there'll be, I like the parallel with the COVID situation where we've had, where we've had 18 months of being told we're going to follow the science, first of all. And so just as we followed the science on COVID, we must follow the science on climate. Second of all, we've been told uh, we have some headroom to make choices and the science dictates how much headroom we have. So, for example, we were facing decisions a year ago on, you know, given COVID levels in hospitals and so on, we can make some easements. We can't make, we can't ease everything, we can ease something. So we can say, okay, you can go to a cafe, but you can't do something else. And those trade-offs within the headroom available were understood. And I think we need to think similarly in carbon terms. You know, we, we, we'll have some carbon headroom as we reach towards 2050. It's decreasing carbon headroom. And within that carbon headroom, we can do some things that have a, an adverse impact. So there will be some roads that even despite the carbon impact, it's tolerable to go ahead with. And that's what we need to figure out. You know, will there be a case for road safety or air quality or connectivity or whatever, where road schemes in some circumstances are permissible but it should be the the exception not the rule so we've set up a panel under Lynn Sloman uh, impressive uh, group of transport and climate experts they're reviewing all the existing schemes and then they're going to come up with a set of recommendations we've already put uh, uh, one road through the process and we're about to do it for another scheme because there's European funding at stake and they wanted to do the decision and the one that's hit the headlines is the can better bypass in very rural going there, the small mile long section of road to link to a, a, a disused airfield they want to build a business park on. Uh, council feel very strongly that for economic development in terms of morality concerns, this should go ahead. Panel recommended not, and it's proving it's proving very difficult. Um, so you know it may be that in some cases we'll decide that access is is a, is a permissible. Uh, condition. The problem with access, it is often used to game the system, isn't it? So something is described as an access rule is actually creating a new out of town housing estate. So we can't be blasé about access as a, as a free pass. There needs to be far more of a, a granular assessment than that. And that's what the word, the roads review will work through. But as far as the, the, the Gwyneth decision goes, you know, we have said to them, uh, because, you know, that's a classic example of them having decided in advance they wanted to build a road, regardless of what Weltax said. And sure enough, Weltax said you should build a road because they did it. Um, so we're saying, well, let's go back to square one. Let's work through Weltag without that lens. We will fund uh, alternatives. Uh, and let's use Cambeda as a an example of how this can be done in rural areas. Because you look at rural Germany or Switzerland or Sweden, you know, they're more sparsely populated than rural Wales in many cases, and they have a better public transport system and they have genuine alternatives to the car. And we do not, because for 70 years we've done things a certain way. And the, you know, and the challenge in the next 70 years, in 70 years from now, Wales is going to be underwater. All the world's coral reefs are going to be dead. And approaching 70% of our ecosystems will have been destroyed 
if we carry on our current climate change trajectory. So, you know, I don't think people, there's a, there's a cognitive dissonance at play here. People on some levels have acknowledged the science, but then carry on doing what they've always done. And there has to be a disruption to that, but the disruption is painful and difficult. And, and that's what we're going through. Yeah, I mean, I think this is is where it gets real, isn't it? Because th there are hard decisions involved in decarbonisation if you're going to do it, and um, you're addressing some of those where perhaps other areas are, are sticking to the easier parts for the moment. Um, I just wanted to to move on to um, another element of what the future holds, because COVID has has triggered a, a monumental shift in many people's working lives with more home working, and that's triggered a a, a debate about in many parts of the world about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing in terms of the economy for different kinds of people, for society. Um, uh, the Welsh Government seems to put its cards on the table and wants 30% of people to work uh, remotely on a regular basis. Uh, uh, why is that and, and what are you going to do to to support that and make it happen? Well, first of all, I would say, you know, and, and this is a theme that permeates throughout the answers, discussion is i think my conclusion of having observed and studied politics and decision making is leadership matters leadership is important uh, and it requires courage and character i think from leaders to say this is the direction we're going to go in uh, now sometimes back to that in the johnson example we we're touching on earlier sometimes you don't have all the powers to deliver on that it's about signal sending signals about setting tone uh, it's about convening uh, it's about example uh, and that permeates through the system so this is a good example in terms of this 30 percent uh, work remotely target you know we don't have the powers to deliver on this. this is not a hard target this is welsh government setting a signal of what we want to see and we set it at the time when uh, you know we were we were just in lockdown coming out of lockdown and what we did not want to see was a reversion to to what we had before uh, lockdown you know there is no reason that this, the pandemic showed for people to be in their office at every morning at nine o'clock uh, everybody driving the same way congesting the roads it didn't need to happen you know lots of people 40 percent of people at the height of the pandemic were working from home um, so it wasn't always great for everybody and, it, and we shouldn't idealize it but it did show that remote working flexible working was possible now if we'd had this conversation three years ago a range of businesses would have said it's just not possible for our business it can't be done it's not practical and it surely was practical uh, now it's now we are fully acknowledging it's a bad experience for some people if you are a victim of domestic abuse working from home is not a good thing to be encouraging so we're not being uh, dogmatic about it what we're emphasizing is flexibility uh, and the ability to work from home or near to home some part of the week and going into the office for some part of the week so we've been trialing a system uh, of uh, remote working hubs we're looking at some of these in town centres as a way of getting people back into their local high street rather than driving, in my case, from Hinahi to Cardiff uh, or Hinahi to Swansea, when you could perfectly work either at your kitchen table or at the remote working hub, either in a country park, we're trialling one, so you can see nature at lunchtime, or in the town centre. So we, we're giving you, we're trialling. It's an iterative process when we'll, we'll see what works and what doesn't work. But the idea that you always had to do what we always did it just needs to change. Um, there's some great questions coming up in the chat and I'm going to bring them in very shortly. Uh, but I just wanted to ask you a further question, which is there are quite a lot of local authorities in, in Wales cutting across functional travel areas. Doesn't Wales need properly empowered uh, regional uh, transport authorities? Given the scale of your ambitions and the kind of capacity and skills you'll need to carry that out, given that you could argue Wales actually probably breaks down into roughly four travel areas, south, west, mid and north. I can't remember who said it, but uh, I think it was in the 60s or 70s, there's no more conservative beast than the, than the British trade union leader. Well, the, the same the same can be said of, of local authority leaders. You know, the, the idea of uh, pooling their powers with their neighbouring local authorities and forming regional authorities has so far proven to be an unattractive one. Uh, so what we are doing is creating what we're calling corporate joint committees, which is bringing together at the regional level local authorities to collaborate on certain functions. And one of them is regional transport strategy. And as I said, we're working with them to co-produce a model on bus 
uh, regulation and organization, uh, which, which blurs that, which has a sort of a national level through TFW as well as a local authority, as well as a regional. So we're sort of finding, we're feeling a way and finding a way uh, through this. But, but absolutely, we want more regional working to get that heft and that economy of scale, as well as that strategic overview. Because one of the problems we're facing, as I'm sure, authorities across England are facing too, is just capacity, you know, which has been hollowed out through austerity after 10 years, and we are now really struggling to get all the expertise that you need to run a fully functioning multimodal transport system, and that is easier done when resources are pooled. Okay, and um, certainly a something that uh, is familiar. The, the current system of local government is always the most perfect one until the next one is created and that turns out to be the one that shouldn't be changed as well but um let's move on to some uh questions um i just lost oh, okay yeah so from uh someone you may be familiar with stephen joseph uh, can you say a bit about the links between transport and planning especially new housing Wales seems to be following a different path to england how are you ensuring that new development has sustainable and active travel at its heart Great question. So one of the reasons why our department, so I'm now, I am the Deputy Minister for Climate Change. And Julie James, my colleague, is the Minister for Climate Change. And between us, we have been given responsibility for a department that uh, makes me weep sometimes. So in one department, we have uh, transport, housing, planning, environment, energy, regeneration, and digital. There might be something else I can't remember. And the idea behind bringing all those things together is from climate terms, these are the primary domestic generators of emissions, but also they are siloed. Uh, and how do we get them to work together to join up these policies? Again, easier said than done, and we're working that through. Um, but Sreeza is absolutely right. The planning system absolutely has the key role to play here. And we are we are passing policies that would say all the right thing. Um, so, but... This is this is the you know, the difference between poetry and prose again. Is the, pra the practice remains the same? So we have had for some time policy which says out of town development uh, is is discouraged, not allowed, whatever words you want to use. Still happening. So why is it still happening? Uh, so we've just I've just with my regeneration minister hat on just published a report by Professor Carol Williams from Manchester University on uh, the impact uh, on towns, uh, and, and he's very robust in his analysis about the impact of uh, out-of-town uh, car development uh, about the need to disrupt the situation and he suggests some quite sort of radical things like refusing to, to you know to connect out-of-town developments to the sewerage network <laughs> just, which I, I, quite like, I, quite, <laughs> I quite like the disruptive thinking but we, we set up a group and we're going to work through the implementation of some of those uh, things. But there is, I think, a disconnect, and back to the theme of the conversation, really, between policy and practice. Uh, and there are strong economic forces at play here, and there are strong local forces at play too. And there are conventional orthodox ways of thinking, which are deeply set in. So, you know, we shouldn't delude ourselves how difficult it is to change this. But, but getting that joined up, both in terms of policy, but also in practice, is vital. And again, back to the roads review, I think that's one of the important functions that has to try and disrupt that way of thinking. And it's really diff politically difficult. So we have a scheme that, and, and you know, here's a disruptive a further factor, the UK government post-Brexit uh, are interfering with the devolution settlement. Transport is meant to be devolved, but the way the European funds were previously administered were on a Wales basis. Now they're being administered on a UK basis, and we have different policy objectives. So they are using their levelling up fund to fund local authorities to do things at variance with what we think they should be doing. So one example is despite the roads review, they funded the Welsh local authority to build a road, even though they know it's captured by our roads review. So they're deliberately, and it's a Labour authority, so they're deliberately playing politics to try and sow division here, to try and enforce their worldview onto the devolution settlement and just bugger about, frankly, and, you know, it is profoundly unhelpful. What I find really interesting, I'll just stop on this point, is the way that different parts of the UK are moving. Is increasingly England is an outlier on transport policy. Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and we meet, are increasingly aligned in our thinking around modal shift and decarbonisation. And England is 
back in the 80s, it seems to me. It's still going hell for leather on road building. It's got a new climate strategy, uh, which is all about technical fixes. You know, we can have magical airplanes, which means we can carry on doing what we've always done. And hypermobility is still deeply embedded in, in the mindset. And I think that is clearly not reflected by the practices and thinking in Manchester and other parts of uh, the English regions. And I do think, and I think this forum is a way of doing it. We need to we need to form an alternative access here, really, which says, you know, we're not on the same page here, and we're doing things differently, and we're going to help each other to do it if you're not going to play ball. And I think, going back to one of the things you said earlier there around, I think one of the challenges of decarbonisation, if we're really going to do it, is how do you make it everyone's job within local authorities, and how do you get the read across between what someone's doing in economic development and transport and and housing, and something we'd like to explore further as the urban transport group. Um, but um, I must uh, keep going and bring more people in. Um, so I wanted to bring in Rod uh, King's question. Um, uh, it's always seemed remarkable to me that we accept. Uh, this level of carnage on our roads and it's uh, seen as an act of God and also the uh, the discrepancy between the tough safety regulation regime that exists for rail, for maritime and aviation and the uh, rather antediluvian system we have on roads if we have anything at all. So um, he wanted to explore a bit around the plans for 20 mile an hour uh, default speed limits um, in Wales and if you tell us a bit about what the rationale for this is and how you're going to take that forward. Well, first of all, kudos to you, Jonathan, for, for saying anti-deluvian. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, you know, I think that deserves some praise. Uh, uh, well, Rod's been instrumental in, get, in helping us be on the journey towards uh, 20 being plenty, and hats off to him. He's a you know, remarkable, indefatigable, I can match you, uh, uh, campaigner and, uh, and and a great practical help too. Um, so with his help, we created a 21-hour um, task force led by Phil Jones, which brought together all the different stakeholders and experts to work out what was the best way of introducing 20 as a default urban speed limit in Wales. Um, that's been accepted. Uh, it's got cross-party support. Uh, we are currently uh, trialling in eight different parts of Wales, uh, different elements of the implementation from monitoring to air quality to community engagement, um, <coughs> to enforcement, working with the police. Police were not very helpful to begin with and now fully on board, um, pleased to say. But it's, you know, again, it's a it's behaviour change process akin to not drinking and driving or putting seatbelts on. So this is going to be a, a process, not an event. Uh, as uh, Ron Davis once said about devolution. Um, but it's important, impo we're making important steps. So the intention is to introduce it across Wales in April 2023. Uh, and, we, and that's going to be a change in the law overnight that will apply everywhere. There's an exceptions process we're currently trialling. So Transport for Wales is producing a map of every area showing where our formula suggests there should be uh, exceptions to the 20 and then it's up for local authorities then to consult uh, against this against the framework of whether or not that's the case and then everywhere unless uh, signposted will be 20 not 30 turning on the head its head the current process um, so it's uh, going to be imperfect is my sense um, uh, there's there is going to be uh, a lot of noise from people who don't like it uh, but I think just as receipt belts, I think we'll look back in 20, 30 years' time and think it was crazy we hadn't done it sooner. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, Barbara Castle was sent a bullet in the post when she was doing her uh, efforts around uh, uh, drink driving and introducing any limits on drink driving and uh, introducing seat belts. She had to get a um, security guard, uh, but then she probably did that for the publicity, being Barbara Castle. Um, uh, John Whiteleg, uh, talking of indefatigable, uh, John Whiteleg. We've got all the greats today. Yeah. <laughs> this, is a, this is a who's who, this is. <laughs> yeah, you've got them all. Um, so John Whiteleg, uh, extending the points about road safety, asks, why not go to the next uh, level, really? Why not introduce a Sweden has a Vision Zero policy? Well, John's being a bit naughty here because John was on a call with me last night when we were discussing just this. Uh, so we are, I'm really interested in his experience 
of Scandinavian countries uh, and seeing what we can learn from that and whether or not we can go uh, further. Again, it's cultural change. Cultural change takes leadership and courage and, you know, uh, I'm up for giving it a go, but we need to work it through with partners to understand the practicalities. Okay. Um, Jenny Bates asks, um, would Lee support longer distance cycle lanes, e.g., Quotes, building continuous segregated cycle and pedestrian paths along all single carriageway main roads for 15 kilometres, either side of every settlement, removing road capacity where necessary, as per a report uh, produced by Transport for Quality of Life. Uh, well, that's interesting. I think, you know, I think we probably will get there over time. My focus has been about short journeys and, and, and local journeys. As a starting point, I think in rural areas, I think particularly with e-bikes, there's a case for for a different approach, and I'm interested in exploring that. Um, but my my feeling is is it's uh, it's 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 bringing people along with us to try and unblock local barriers for short journeys and uh, in introducing segregation through road space reallocation through towns uh, will probably get us a greater modal shift in the quickest time. But different communities are different and they will require different uh, solutions. And I think, say for, for, for more sparsely populated areas, uh, I think that there is a case for that. Of course, land availability is, is, a real, uh, is a real challenge. And also the other challenge we've got, frankly, is availability of budget, capacity and expertise. And we have to got to pick our battles. So where do we first make the first moves? You know, do we, dedicate our scarce resource, you know, significantly bigger, but it is still finite on the sort of project that Jenny sets out. Um, or do we try and focus it on quicker wins, uh, capturing more people? And that's that's a judgment, isn't it? My current judgment is uh, is not to prioritise what Jenny is suggesting, uh, but I might be wrong about that. Uh, and um, I think we will, you know, we will live and learn as we feel our way through it. But I certainly think that is part of the package we'll need for different communities. Okay. And Ken Barker asks, where are we now with the new well tag in terms of considering modal shifts in proposed transport schemes? Well, we updated well tag uh, a couple of years ago after the Welsh Future Generations Commissioner challenged it. Uh, and I think it's better. But as I said earlier, well tag is only as good as the people who use it. And I think that is our major problem. So. Uh, one of our commitments in the Wales Transport Strategy is to look again at it, but really through the roads review, I think we need to be looking in parallel about how that is used, um, because ultimately it's just a framework and it can be manipulated. So I think focusing just on the process and not about the intent uh, is is missing the point, really. So I think that I think we need to do the, the two in parallel. So we're running up to the end of time. Sorry, we can't get through everybody's questions but i just wanted to finish with a question for for you lee which is do you, do you think you can get wales to change the way it travels um in line with the the extent of the necessity of the uh, climate crisis i don't know but i'm gonna give it a bloody good try great okay well i think on that note it sounds like a good note to to finish i think many of the people who have been listening in and participating in this conversation will be wishing you all the best with that uh, struggle and that challenge and uh, appreciate the the wider leadership that Wales is now giving really uh, across the, the four nations. And thanks for your candour and for your time. It's been a fascinating discussion and I will hand over to Claire. Thanks very much. And thanks very much to Lee and Jonathan for what was a fantastic discussion and conversation. I'm particularly impressed by how Wales are taking on the really tricky and difficult challenges in decarbonising transport by pausing road schemes and exploring road user charging, and by being bold and continuing to encourage people to work remotely for the wide range of benefits that can bring. And personally, I love the idea of working in a hub in a country park. I hope you'll be able to join us for Urban Transport Next 11 in January, where our topic will be urban freight and logistics. In the meantime, thanks again to our panel and to everyone who took part live and for those listening in to the podcast or watching the playback on YouTube afterwards. Thanks and goodbye. <laughs>